I am continuing our series on the minor prophets, and we're up to Jonah. Jonah is probably uh, the best known of the minor prophets. People remember his story very easily. Even children know the basics of the story about Jonah. Now, in this message, I'm probably going to have two messages on Jonah. In this message, we are going to look at 12 truths about God that move us to give him thanks. Uh, This message could also be called Jonah and Thanksgiving. Uh, I'm uh, making this message to share with my church the Sunday before Thanksgiving. So I usually look for a Thanksgiving theme that Sunday, and I was thinking I would Uh, likely take a break from the minor prophets, but I was up to Jonah, and I thought, well, maybe I should just read Jonah and see if there's anything in there that would fit for Thanksgiving. And boy, what a great book for Thanksgiving message, which surprised me a little bit. Maybe it surprises you. Now, of course, Christians can give thanks all year round. We should give thanks all year round. We should always be praying with Thanksgiving. So this message is not just for Thanksgiving week. It can be listened to any time. But right in the middle of the book, there's a section of the book that people remember the least. is Jonah's prayer uh, when he's down in the belly of the fish underwater. And, 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 and in this prayer, as he realizes that God is rescuing him, he, he, he prays with shouts of grateful praise. Jonah was filled with thanksgiving. We should be filled with thanksgiving. Now, when we think about things to give God thanks for, like maybe if you do this around the thanksgiving table, which is a great thing to do, by the way, um, we often give him thanks for people, which is a very good thing to give God thanks for, for our family and for our extended family, for our church. Sometimes we give thanks to God for things he's provided for us, for, for jobs and and houses, and safety, and there's so many different things, and all of those things we should give God thank, thanks for. I mean, I even give God thanks for our family dog, who um, is my faithful, furry, walking friend. She goes with me on a walk every morning in the, in the fields uh, uh, near the small town where I, I, I live. Um, so there's all kind of things we can thank God for. But in the book of Jonah, we are going to be looking at um, some of the, in a way, there's some of the biggest, deepest things to thank God for. Uh, most of these things, and, and there's a, going to be a list of them, uh, 12 of them, but two of them are very similar, and that's on purpose, that's okay. Uh, but there's going to be a list of these things, and most of them have to do with how God relates to us and interacts with with us because of who he is. And wow, these are just huge reasons to give God thanks. I hope that this message won't just be interesting. I hope that it will sink into your heart and mind and shape your prayer life and your uh, practice of giving thanks to God, both uh, this Thanksgiving, if you happen to hear the message before Thanksgiving, but also just all of the time. Now, um, Normally, uh, if I was doing a message like this and I had part one and part two, in part one I would give a, a, some more background information and um, things like that, historical information to help with the setting a little bit. I've done that with the other minor prophets. I'll probably do a little bit more of that in Jonah part uh, two. Uh, Jonah, just very briefly, Jonah was a prophet. Uh, in Israel during the time of the divided kingdom. Uh, He lived, uh, it was almost 800 years before Jesus was born, maybe around 770, 780 years before then is when he did his prophesying and when this story takes place. Um, Assyria, which is where Nineveh is, was a far nation that was hostile to Israel most of the time. And... um, uh, and, 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 and it was a pagan nation that, that didn't believe in the true God. And um, uh, so anyways, I think that's enough setting. This is one of most of the minor prophets. To be honest, they're a little bit hard to understand without some help from a commentary or a good study Bible that gives you some context. Because 
they talk about all these places that we don't know about and, 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 and when is this happening and uh, it can be kind of confusing. But Jonah, most people get the message quite easily even if they don't know the answers to all those questions. So we are going to jump right in. We are going to go through the whole book of Jonah. Um, I'm going to read it and then stop when there's, there, there's uh, things I want to point out. Um, even though it's four chapters, they're short chapters. All four chapters together have less verses than some of the long chapters. Like in the book of Luke, there's some really long chapters, for example. So it's not that long of a book. Uh, so let's pray, and then we'll jump in. Heavenly Father, I pray that you will speak to our hearts and minds about how good you are and remind us of how many reasons we have to give thanks to you through this well-known story of Jonah and help us to um, see it, perhaps see some things in it that we haven't noticed before. Uh, in Jesus' name, amen. Now, even though we're going through the whole book, there are some aspects of this and some points, some themes that we're not going to cover, and that's why this is part one. Lord willing, I'll, I'll have another message on Jonah. Here we go. Jonah chapter one. The word of the Lord came to Jonah, son of Amittai. Go to the great city of Nineveh and preach against it, because its wickedness has come up before me. Okay, the first reason to give thanks to God is that God cares about people even if they live in a wicked place. Um, so now when you read this, you might think, well, it doesn't sound like God cares about them because he's sending Jonah to preach against them. But when we read the story, we find out that it's a warning designed to help them and rescue them. And it does help them. It does rescue them from destruction. And so God wants to help these people, even though Nineveh is an evil, wicked place. Now, you could be tempted, probably you're not, but somebody out there could be tempted to think, well, this doesn't really apply to me because I, I, I don't live in a wicked place. Oh, oh boy. When I think about myself, I thank God there are some really good things about the, the, the nation I live in, about the United States, but there was definitely some ways in which this is a wicked nation. Um, when I think about all of the millions of unborn babies that we kill, when I think about this election we just had, when many people voted specifically for the purpose of trying to um, allow the evil abortion industry to continue to slaughter uh, hundreds of thousands, if not millions, of, of more unborn uh, babies, uh, that is wicked. And then I think about um, the fact that our nation is blessed with this huge amount of technology and we're the technological center of the world in many ways. Um, but, we, but, but one of the ways we use that is to flood the whole world through the internet with uh, pornography. And, it, and it's doing a huge amount of damage all over the world. And then I think about the fact that our nation um, promotes and celebrates some types of sexual immorality we should be grieved over those when people are, are tempted in those ways. Uh, instead of celebrating them and encouraging them to continue, we should uh, lovingly try to help them to get out of that sin. And, and, and even if they continue to have wrong desires, we should help them to say no to those wrong desires. Everybody has wrong desires throughout their life that we have to say no to. But instead, we encourage the wrong desires. There was, there's a lot of th and those are not all of the things that make this a wicked place. So, so when I see that God cared about this, the people of Nineveh and gave them uh, an opportunity to repent, I'm thankful because it gives me hope for myself and my uh, daughter and her generation and the generations that are coming after her and for our nation as a whole. And this probably applies to whatever nation you live in, even if it's not the United States. Some nations are wicked in different ways from others. Maybe somewhere on the planet there's a nation that's not that wicked right now. If so, I don't know where it is. Let's keep going. Uh, verse 3. But Jonah ran away from the Lord and hot headed for Tarshish. We'll talk about this part of the story more next week, Lord willing. He went down to uh, Joppa where he found a ship bound for that port. He's basically going the opposite direction. Uh, from Nineveh. 
After paying the fare, he went aboard and sailed for Tarshish to flee from the Lord. Then the Lord sent a great wind on the sea, and such a violent storm arose that the ship threatened to break up. Okay, throughout the story, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to highlight this. God is the one who's making things happen. And, and, and so one of the first, okay, God is the one who calls Jonah, and then God sends the great wind. This isn't some random wind. God sends the wind. And this points to something else good about God. God doesn't give up on us even when we run away from him. Now, it's not any fun for Jonah, I'm sure, to be on the ship in the storm. But the purpose of God sending the storm is to get Jonah back on track. Think about the alternative. God could have just let Jonah go. And then Jonah would have ran away from God. Of course, you can't really be anywhere where God's at, but he would have ran away from God's will, from God's plans, from God's purpose. And away from God, there is no meaningful peace. There's no deep joy. There's no um, uh, love like the kind of love that God has and that he wants us to have for each other. Uh, You're on the road to destruction when you're not with God. There's nothing good about that for Jonah. So even though Jonah is choosing to run away from him, and God could have said, fine, go then. Do you think that God needed Jonah? Do you think God couldn't have raised up a hundred different people uh, to do this, prepared them and raised them up and got them ready and sent them to do this? Or God could have not even used a person. God could have sent an angel. Uh, or, Or God could have, you know, miraculously made the moon talk to the people of Nineveh. That would have been really weird. But the point is that God didn't need Jonah, but God loves Jonah, and he wants to use Jonah for good, and he doesn't allow Jonah to just leave him. Metaphorically speaking, it's as if God runs after us when we run away from God. That's amazing love. We're just hurting ourselves. God doesn't need us, but he, even though he doesn't need us, He loves us, and he comes after us. That's an awesome God. Let's keep going. Um, All the sailors were afraid, and each cried out to his own God. So these sailors were apparently not Israelites who knew and served the true God. Whatever nationality they were, they had other gods that were not true gods. Uh, Keep that in mind. Um, Continuing, and they threw the cargo into the sea to lighten the ship. So they were really desperate. Uh, But Jonah had gone below deck, where he lay down and fell into a deep sleep. The captain went to him and said, How can you sleep? Get up and call on your God. Maybe he will take notice of us so that we will not perish. Then the sailors said to each other, Come, let us cast lots to find out who is responsible for this calamity. They cast lots, and the lot fell on Jonah. Now, this is not a coincidence. God was in charge of the wind and the storm. God is also in charge of the lots. Now, that doesn't mean that you should normally use casting lots or throwing dice or anything like that to find out God's will. There are some rare cases uh, where that, at least one case I can think of in the book of Acts, where, where they did use a method somewhat like that. But, but that's not the norm in the Bible. It shouldn't be the norm in your life. But in this case, God intervenes. In Proverbs, it says, the lot is cast into the lap, but its every decision is from the Lord. And this brings us to reason number three to thank God. God is in control. Even things that feel random or chaotic are still under God's control. Um, And this is good news because God is good, God loves us, and he's the one that's in control of everything that happens, the weather, uh, the situation, um, and even, in this case, uh, the drawing of the lot. So God is in control of everything that's going on. Continuing, so they asked him, tell us who's responsible for making all this trouble for us. They're asking this to Jonah. What kind of work do you do? Where do you come from? What is your country? From what people are you? (laughs) <laughs> they ask him what kind of work he does. It reminds me of the VeggieTales uh, story about Jonah. Jonah was a prophet. <laughs> yeah, he's a, 
He's a prophet, but he's not being a good prophet right now. He answered, I am a Hebrew, and I worship the Lord, the God of heaven, who made the sea and the dry land. Wow. Uh, he worships God who made, well, he made everything. And that's the fourth reason to thank God. We thank God for making everything. Aren't you glad that God made uh, the earth for you to walk on and food for you to eat and beautiful trees for you to look at and the stars in the sky and air for you to breathe and water for you to drink? God made everything, and he made our universe specifically as a special place uh, for us to live, and he made the planet Earth very special to be a place where that would be a good home for human beings. So we thank God because he made everything. God is thanked for making everything throughout the Bible, including in the book of Revelation. Uh, people are thanking God for creating all things, and we should thank God for that also. Continuing in the story, verse 10, this terrified them. Because Jonah is worshiping this great God who made the land and the sea, and the sea is right now the problem for them. This terrified them, and they asked, what have you done? They knew he was running away from the Lord because he had already told them so. The sea was getting rougher and rougher. So they asked him, what should we do to you to make the sea calm down for us? Pick me up and throw me into the sea, he replied, and it will become calm. I know that it is my fault that this great storm has come upon you. Now, now, even though these guys don't know the true God, they're pretty good guys. They don't want to throw Jonah into the sea. So verse 13, instead, the men did their best to row back to land, but they could not, for the sea grew even wilder than before. Then they cried out to the Lord. Notice this. Before they were crying out to false gods, now they're crying out to the one true God. So there's already been a change for good in their lives. Then they cried out to the Lord, Please, Lord, do not let us die for taking this man's life. Do not hold us accountable for killing an innocent man. For you, Lord, have done as you pleased. Then they took Jonah and threw him overboard, and the raging sea grew calm. At this the men greatly feared the Lord, and they offered a sacrifice to the Lord and made vows to him. So now, these people, these men who before were worshiping and calling on false gods, now they're worshiping the one true God the best way they know how. And this reminds me that God cares about normal, everyday uh, people. Uh, these these uh, sailors, uh, often we don't think about them as major characters in the story, but God was thinking about them, and God uses the events that happen to bring them to a faith in the true God. And I'm hopeful that when we are resurrected to eternal life, um, that I'll get to meet these guys and, and, and that they will also have eternal life because of the faith they gained in the one true God. And, 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 and God calmed the sea for them. So they didn't die. They didn't lose their lives. God had, had mercy and brought them to faith in himself. Uh, verse 17, now the Lord provided a huge fish to swallow Jonah, and Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. Now remember, God brought the storm, God was in control of the lots being cast, and now God is the one who provides uh, the fish. It's not just some random fish or whale uh, in, 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 in Hebrew, uh, you know, it could have referred to what we would call a, a, a big fish, or it could refer to a whale. God provided it. It may have been a special fish that God made for this purpose. I don't know what kind of fish or whale it was, but it swallowed Jonah, and that was part of God's plan. Chapter 2. From inside the fish, Jonah prayed to the Lord his God. He said, in my distress, I called to the Lord, and he answered me. From deep in the realm of the dead, I called for help, and you listened to my cry. Excuse me. I have some, uh, some allergies, and, and they bother me this time of year, pretty much all year round, but um, they've been bothering me a little bit recently. Okay. So, um, in my distress, I called to the Lord, and he answered me. 
The sixth big reason to give thanks to God, God heals our desperate cries for help, even when it is our own fault that we are in a desperate situation. This is, this is God's great love. Jonah's down in that fish, down in the ocean, and it's not God's fault. It's Jonah's fault. Jo- Jonah's the one who ran away from God. Jonah's the one who was sinning. Jonah got himself into this mess. But when he cries for help, God still listens to him. And here's good news for you. If you are in a desperate situation, and it's your own fault that you got there, the good news is that if you cry out to God in Jesus' name, he will heal your prayer, and he will help you. God is good. We should Thank God for how good he is. Okay, continuing. Uh, Jonah is, this is still Jonah's prayer. You hold me into the depths, into the very heart of the seas, and the, and the currents swirled about me. All your waves and breakers swept over me. I said, I have been banished from your sight, yet I will look again toward your holy temple. Jonah still had faith in God, even though he was running away from him. The engulfing waters threatened me. The deep surrounded me. The seedweed was wrapped around my head. To the roots of the mountains I sank down. The earth beneath barred me in forever. But you, Lord my God, brought my life up from the pit. This reminds me of uh, a psalm, Psalm 40 by David, for the director of music of David, a psalm. I waited patiently for the Lord. He turned to me and heard my cry. He lifted me out of the slimy pit, out of the mud and mire. He set my feet on a rock and gave me a firm place to stand. He put a new song in my mouth, a hymn of praise to our God. Many will see and fear the Lord and put their trust in him. The seventh thing that we give God thanks for is that God rescues us from slimy pits that we could never get out of on our own. Jonah had no ability to save himself. He couldn't get out of the fish. If he did, he couldn't get out of the ocean without drowning. Yet, Jonah has, there's no way he can save himself. Every one of us are in the same situation when we come to Jesus for salvation. We cannot save ourselves from our sins. This is one of the big differences between Christianity and all the other worldviews and religions and beliefs. Um, It's good to do good works. It's good to uh, have spiritual disciplines to pray and uh, to read the Bible and all those types of things and go to church. Those are important things to do, but we don't get saved uh, by our own efforts at doing those things. We could never save ourselves. Jesus saves us from our sins. In fact, that's why he's named Jesus. You can go... Read, I think it's in Matthew, tells us. What, why is he named Jesus? The name Jesus means uh, Yahweh, or God, saves. And it's because he saves us from our sins. So God did this for Jonah, and he does it for us. Okay, continuing. Uh, Jonah's still in his prayer. When my life was ebbing away, I remembered you, Lord, and my prayer rose to you, to your holy temple. Those who cling to worthless idols turn away from God's love for them. But I, with shouts of grateful praise, right in the middle of the book of Jonah, there's this outburst of a shout of grateful praise. We should, look, it's fine to give God thanks with, you know, a quiet voice and reverently, but every now and then we should get loud and get excited about what God has done for us and what God and who God is, and whoo, shouts of grateful praise. I I hope you do that. I'm not, you don't have to do it every day, but I hope, I hope you give thanks every day, and I hope every now and then, uh, you just, you just, uh, lose all of your inhibitions, this type of inhibition. There are inhibitions that are very healthy, but, but, and, 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 and you just shout with grateful praise. But I, with shouts of grateful praise, will sacrifice to you. What I have vowed, I will make good. I will say, salvation comes from the Lord. Amen. 
And the Lord commanded the fish, and it vomited Jonah onto dry land. The Lord commanded the fish. Okay, the Lord sent the fish, and now the Lord commands the fish to, to uh, get Jonah out. Not a very pleasant method, but it's a lot better than staying in the fish. So, um, let's see. Uh, Jonah 3. Then the word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time. Go to the great city of Nineveh and proclaim to it the message I give you. Jonah obeyed the word of the Lord and went to Nineveh. Now, Nineveh was a very large city. It took uh, three days to go through it. Now, look, God, God gives Jonah a second chance. God often gives us second chances, sometimes very, very specific second chances in some kind of a ministry opportunity. We missed it. We blew it. And, so, and, and, and then God sometimes gives us a second chance. Sometimes he gives us more than two chances. In terms of his forgiving us, he gives us way more than two chances. His mercies are new every morning. Every day we pray, forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Every day God is forgiving us. And um, he gives us second chances and more. And I am so, so thankful that he does. Whew. God is good. Okay, uh, verse 4, Jonah began by going a day's journey into the city, proclaiming, 40 more days and Nineveh will be overthrown. The Ninevites believed God. A fast was proclaimed, and all of them, from the greatest to the least, put on sackcloth. The Ninevites believed God. They believed Jonah's message. Now, this reminds us, that uh, God uses very imperfect people to do good things. Even though Jonah had initially ran away from him, and as we are going to see, even when Jonah goes to Nineveh, his heart is still not in this. He's still not feeling and thinking the right way about this task that God gave him. Even though that's true, and even though Jonah is kind of a mess, God still uses Jonah to lead the Ninevites to repentance and salvation. I am so thankful that God uses messed up people. Now, we should never use this as an excuse for being messed up. We should try with God's help to get better and to be less messed up. But it gives me hope that God uses messed up people. I think Christians want to be used by God to do good things. And sometimes we feel like God's not going to use me I'm such a mess. <laughs> I'm not going to argue with you that you're such a mess because I'm such a mess too, so I can feel the reality of that. What I'm going to tell you is that even though you are such a mess, God will use you to go do good things. Trust him. Believe he forgives you. Be washed clean. Be cleansed of all unrighteousness. Believe that his Holy Spirit will walk through you even though you're such a mess. Don't use that as an excuse to... Um, uh, you know, not walk on being less messy, but believe that God will use you. You're never going to be completely um, not messed up, completely perfect until you're resurrected. So praise God, God uses imperfect people to do good things. Okay. Verse 6, when Jonah's warning reached the king of Nineveh, he rose from his throne, took off his royal robes, covered himself with sackcloth, and sat down in the dust. This is an outward sign of apparently was a true repentance because God can see, see their hearts, and, and God sees that they are truly repenting. Uh, this is the proclamation he issued in Nineveh. By the decree of the king and his nobles, do not let people or animals, hordes or flocks, taste anything. Do not let them eat or drink. Uh, he's taking this repentance very seriously. But let people and animals be covered with sackcloth. Excuse me. Let everyone call urgently on God. Let them give up their evil ways and their violence. Who knows? God may re yet relent and with compassion turn from his fierce anger so that we will not perish. Hallelujah. Whew. When God saw what they did and how they turned from their evil ways, he relented. And did not bring on them the destruction he had threatened. God is gracious, abounding in love, willing to forgive. Jonah himself is going to point that out soon, but we see it in the story. 
this was a wicked place, a wicked nation. Um, uh, they were bad enough. Look, God never judges wrongly. They were bad enough that God really was going to destroy them in 40 days. Jonah was giving a true message from God, and that's how bad they were. But God, when he sees that they repent, and, and we can see their outward actions, but apparently God saw that at least many of them were truly repenting, God forgives them, and he has mercy on them. Okay, now we're in the last chapter, a short chapter at the end. But to Jonah, this seemed very wrong, and he became uh, angry. Okay, uh, to Jonah, this seemed very wrong. It wasn't wrong at all, but uh, instead of trusting that God was doing right and good and celebrating it, Jonah's heart still isn't in the right place. So let's see what happens. Uh, he, and, and we're going to talk about this more, Lord willing, in the second message on Jonah next week. But we'll mention it a little bit now. Verse 2. He prayed to the Lord, Isn't this what I said, Lord, when I was still at home? That, uh, that is what I tried to forestall by fleeing to Tarshish. I knew that you are a gracious and compassionate God, slow to anger and abounding in love, a God who relents from sending calamity. Now, Jonah's glad when God shows him mercy, but God didn't, I'm sorry, but Jonah didn't want God to show the people of Nineveh mercy. Uh, Jonah didn't like those pagan, evil, hostile foreigners. And uh, so let's keep going. Now the Lord... Uh, now, Lord, take, take away my life, for it is better for me to die than to live. <laughs> Jonah's just being ridiculous. But sometimes you and I get a bit ridiculous, don't we? Uh, but the Lord replied, is it right for you to be angry? Jonah had gone out and sat down at a place east of the city. There he made himself a shelter, sat in its shade, and waited to see what would happen to the city. I think Jonah's hoping that maybe their repentance wasn't sincere and that God's still going to fry them. Whew, Jonah's heart is not in the right place. He should be praying for them, not uh, hoping to see them fried. Verse 6, Then the Lord God provided a leafy plant and made it grow up over Jonah to give shade for his head to ease his discomfort. And Jonah was very happy about the plant. The eleventh reason to thank God is that he is so patient with Jonah and with us. God could have said, Even after I rescued you, from the ocean and from drowning and from the belly of the, the fish or the whale, you're still acting like this? God could have just sent judgment on Jonah, but instead, God is patiently walking with Jonah to help change his heart. Oh, God, thank you. Aren't you thankful that God patiently walks with us? Now, God is going to teach Jonah a lesson, and it's going to be a little uncomfortable, but God isn't destroying Jonah. He's walking with him to change his heart, uh, even... You know, sometimes it takes a long time for our heart to change. Jonah did. Jonah was kind of forced to go to Nineveh. I mean, what was he going to do? Get swallowed by a second fish? Um, but his heart wasn't really in it. But now God is walking on him at the deep level of his heart. And aren't you thankful that God does that for me and for you? Uh, but at dawn the next day, God provided a warm. God sent the wind. God sent the fish. God sent the plant. God sends the worm. God is in charge of everything in this whole story. Uh, but at dawn the next day, God provided a worm which chewed the plant so that it withered. When the sun rose, God provided a scorching east wind. Okay, he sends that too. And the sun blazed on Jonah's head so that he grew faint. He wanted to die and said, it would be better for me to die than to live. But God said to Jonah, is it right for you to be angry about the plant? It is, he said. I'm so angry I wish I were dead. But the Lord said, You've been concerned about this plant, though you did not tend it or make it grow. It sprang up overnight and died overnight. And should not I have concern for the great city of Nineveh, in which there are more than 120,000 people who cannot tell their right hand from their left, and also many animals. Okay, the right hand from their left, some people think is talking about children who don't know right from left yet. Some people think this is 
symbolically talking about people who don't know right from wrong because they didn't grow up learning God's law and learning God's truth. Either way, God is concerned about these people. He loves them. He cares about them. Even though they've been wicked, God wants to help them to repent and to save them instead of destroy them. And God is teaching Jonah this so that Jonah's heart can be changed. And this is, these are the last verses in the book. Um, so the twelfth, twelfth reason I have to give thanks to God is that God is concerned about people even if they happen to live in evil nations. Now you might think, haven't we seen that one before? <laughs> yes. This is at the beginning of Jonah. It's at the end of Jonah. It's a major theme of the whole book. So since it's covered more than one time in Jonah, I thought it'd be okay to list it more than once. It's, uh, it's okay to give God thanks for basically the same thing more than one time because he keeps being good. Okay, let's review all of the ways that we listed, and you could probably find some more that I didn't list. Uh, from the book of Jonah, things that we should uh, give thanks God for, reasons that we should, uh, 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 reasons that our hearts should be filled with thanksgiving. Let's, let's review these. Number one, God cares about people even if they live in a wicked place. Number two, God doesn't give up on us even when we run away from him. Number three, God is in control. Even things that feel random or chaotic are still under God's control. Number four, we thank God for making everything. Number five, God cares about normal, everyday people. Number six, God heals our desperate cries for help even when it is our own fault that we are in a desperate situation. Number seven, God rescues us from slimy pits that we could never get out of on our own. Number eight, God often gives us second chances and more than two chances often. And then uh, number nine, God uses very imperfect people to do good things. Number 10, God is gracious, abounding in love and willing to forgive. Number 11, God is so patient with Jonah, and he is so patient with you and me. Number 12, God is concerned about people, even if they happen to live in evil nations. In Philippians, we are told that in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. This is what we should do. So let's close in prayer, and I hope that you will pray with thanksgiving, uh, the week of Thanksgiving, but not just that week. Uh, for Christians every day, it, it should be a day of thanksgiving to God. Uh, so let me close us in prayer. Heavenly Father, I thank you for your great love. I thank you that you love us even when we are messed up, we live in a nation full of wickedness, we get ourselves into bad situations and it's our own fault and we're desperate we get into slimy pits that we can't get back out of. And God, you come after us and you love us and you get us out and you rescue us. Thank you. You're, and then you're so patient with us because our hearts still aren't right. Just like Jonas, after all that, his heart still wasn't right. And you patiently walk with us to change our hearts instead of judging us and destroying us. You are so, so good. Thank you, God. Thank you that you are in control of everything. Thank you that you made everything. Thank you that you are so, so good. Please bless everyone who hears this um, with a good thanksgiving, but also with a heart full of thanksgiving because of how good you are. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.